Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I'd like to introduce your host for today's conference, Mr. Glenn Katz. You may begin. Hey there, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome. I want to kind of you welcome you to the uh, first ever Holy Brothers Cat Food webcast and this new series that we try to put together. Um, we're joined today by a couple of very special guests and really a cool uh, like a web series that's going to be about is really
really want it to have that flavor and the whole series to have that flavor. And just so you know where this whole series is going, today we're focusing on these integrated modeling features in Revit. As we progress through the next few weeks, we're going to be looking in two weeks at the issue of visualization in a lot more detail and how to create very compelling renderings of some of the other features of the product. For uh, four weeks out, or two sessions out, we're going to be looking at the whole issue of sustainability and some of the interesting things that's gone on in Revit as well as in the other tools to really get a much better control over how we do thermal modeling and how we can really do sustainability design early in the design education. So a lot of cool things come to head same too with the entire series. But with no further ado, let me dive right into uh, Revit 2013 and give you a sense of really what's available there. But I'm so excited about it. I demonstrate the product. So what I'm going to actually do is shift on over. I'm going to move over to Revit 2013 and just give you a sense of what the product's like. I'm actually bringing up a model right now. It's sort of a very simple little architectural model that I work with a lot to kind of demonstrate things. And in the product, probably the biggest change most people will notice right up front is just that as opposed to there being three different products, Revit Architecture, Revit Structure, and Revit MVP, there's a single product now. All those different features have been integrated together into a single platform. And the real key to the advantage of that is that now students can actually model structural, uh, MEP systems like ductwork, plumbing systems, as well as the architectural features, and really understand how those things interact together. And you need to really design all those different things to work together once we create a true model of what the building is going to be like. So how that actually shows up in the interface, just so you get a sense of it, is if you're familiar with Revit, it's always been the home tab, which contains many new different tools. It's been renamed the architecture tab because it has many different architectural core elements like walls, doors, ceilings, roofs, things like that. What used to be a separate product is now the structure tab. You can see beams and columns and floors and trusses and beam systems in there. And things that were formerly in the Revit MEP products are now showing up at the system tabs. Things like ductwork, piping, cable trays, lighting fixtures, all those sorts of things. And this interface can be adapted and changed depending upon what you need in your own classroom. So, for example, if you're doing an integrated modeling class, you may want your students to look at all three of these different set features. If you're only focusing on a piece of the problem, you can go ahead and go to the interface and choose some options and actually choose which of those different tabs you want to see. So, for example, if I don't really need to see the energy analysis tools or I don't need to see the systems tab or the piping tools or the electrical tools, I can turn those on. Now, as we think about an integrated product, one tip that I actually learned from Angela, thank you very much yesterday, is that uh, in terms of working with different tools, you know, there is you know, something to be said about customizing the interface to make sure that you're seeing the tools that are most relevant for your own class. For example, in structure, if you don't really need to be analyzing the structure, you're only really trying to model the structure elements, it actually has a slight and core performance improvement to turn that off. Because if we keep the analysis tools on, it's actively recomputing a structural analysis model constantly in the background. So you don't need that, and I won't be using them today. I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. That'll make that just a high performance right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and kind of just give you a sense of what I need about the power of integrated modeling. This again is a little architectural model, a preliminary design for a building, which may be very difficult for a lot of different projects that folks are working on. If I switch on over to a different view, I'm going to switch over to another 3D view on the back of the building, which is called a section view. Okay. We can actually start looking at how the building is constructed. And this is sort of something that we get into as we start doing integrated modeling, where we don't only have the architectural elements here, but we're actually starting to model all the structural elements. So you can see in this structure, there are actually some white flange, white flange framing elements, as well as some of K-bar joists that are in here. Okay, up here on the upper level, you can actually see we've gone one step further than we even have the MEG system in there. So, just to give you a sense of where we're going with all this, this is a project that I actually use in my own classroom back at Stanford, but we often start with models that look like this, where we have the whole notion of basically a uh, ceiling and the floor plane and we're trying to squeeze the structure in. But most folks will recognize right away this isn't a very good model because there's really no room within that model to do things like accommodate things like the HVAC system. There's really not enough floor to floor height. So a little bit later, after people are working with it, we start to do things like actually accommodate some space for the HVAC system as well as the structure. And we can, as students, start thinking about how these different systems need to fit in there, decide whether there's really enough room or whether we need to actually start thinking about changing the floor to floor height as necessary to accommodate those systems. 
So the power of integrated modeling with something like this, for example, here I am, I'm looking at that second floor rating. If I want to, for example, change that a little bit, let me comment over here. I can choose as a beam system, which is that different series of K bar joints. And I want to go through and do things really quickly, like just change them. So being spaced every five feet, maybe I want to space them every four feet, or space them every three feet, or even change to a different type of element. I can go through and do that change them to a different type of element if I want to. But what's happening as I uh, go through and make those changes, you're going to see, actually, we're going to hang out. I've got to figure out where I am oriented in the process. I'm just like, I'm not got the back date. Let me go ahead and I'll, I'll switch to the right ones again. Let me try changing those ones instead. Okay, get a three seats. Then when I come to that 3D section view, you'll actually see that the joists in that layer really stays a lot closer to each other. Okay, so the idea is students can really quickly start playing with the structural elements. If they decide that instead of working with a K-bar, it's just a K-joist system, they'd like to go ahead and try that with some lifetime sections or just really any type of structural elements are available. We can start playing with those elements, see what the impact is, and really understand what's going on. Okay, the HVAC system you'll see is also modeled here. If we need to go ahead and start playing around with creating room for that, we can do things like change the height of the ceiling. Go ahead and bring it up. But what I'd also like to do is actually bring up the height of these ceiling registers. So let me go ahead and bring those up also. I'll raise those up so they're at nine feet. And the next thing that happens is when I go through and move the registers, I'm not sure if you saw it there, but the ductwork that's actually connecting to them is readjusted automatically, so it's kind of like uh, maintaining the right relationship and keeping the system connected in there. We can start playing around with these ducts too. If I'm raising that ceiling height, I'd better go ahead and raise those up a little bit too. Maybe I'll raise them up to time for eight. And I can even go through see what's going on there. Eh? Okay. and think about changing the size. So maybe since there's not as much room in the ceiling plane as opposed to being so tall, I need to make them a little like shorter and maybe a little bit wider to go through and like uh, accommodate what we need. So again, that's just sort of integrated modeling, but let's go ahead and kind of think about how that actually sort of plays on out. Once we go through and create the integrated models, we can go through and like, oh, let me show a wall uh, building section that sort of shows all these different things. A lot of the classes I do really get into how you do integrated, like, structural details and put all the building elements together. Here we have kind of an overall building section with a call out of a specific area. Let me take a look at that. This is the detail that might be, oh, uh, what do you want to show in terms of really understanding how the wall, the floor, and the structure are moving together. And the nice thing about doing things in a good model is we can not only do this in a 2D model, and this model is up to date if we make any changes, this detail is going to change, something we can use for our construction details. Okay. But if we also want to go through and show things in 3D, I can take a 3D view, I will set its orientation, to the same as that wall connection detail. And it orbited around a little bit, but let me kind of shift it back into plane so you can see it. And I'll zoom on in. Okay. We now actually have the beginning of a very nice construction detail of 3D that's showing the structural elements, the ceiling, the wall assembly, and some all the different layers, a jam, and a window, a sill window detail. This is the kind of detail that we can do now that really helps students understand what's going on in the building and as they're doing the designs, really make sure they're not just doing abstract forms. So really designing buildings, you know, that are going to be, you know, giving them the proper kinds of experience they need to really go out and get the jobs in the industry that people are looking for now. Okay, so that's all about the integrated model we wanted to get started with, but let me go ahead and turn it over a little bit right now to Angela. Angela. Yeah, there are some really fantastic, in addition to these integrated modeling features, some things that I've heard about in terms of just, oh, you know, the new types of uh, visualization and rendering capabilities that are available. So if we have details like this or other buildings and we want to sort of really start to understand them visually and really communicate them better, can you go ahead and like that show us a little bit about like uh, some of the new advancements that are available there? Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Definitely. Yes, I'm very excited about, you know, the new release as well. There's a lot of exciting um, visualization enhancements that's been made in 2013. And I'll kind of walk through some of them and show you guys some of the capabilities and functionality that's been added uh, on top of what Glenn has said about the integrated model. 
So previously, if we want to go ahead and create um, you know, some more visualizations to Florida, uh, what we would have to do, for example, bringing some, a Revit model into Showcase or 3DS Max Design, a couple of things that we actually previously would do would be, you know, exporting our model as an FDS file and then, you know, put it in a certain location and then I would go and open up Showcase. Um, you know, just, just as an FYI that I think Showcase is probably one of the best programs. You know, it's been one of my favorite lately, especially. It's a very easy but powerful tool if you want to ever create any kind of animation, um, any design alternatives, for example. Uh, what you're seeing the filming behind this here, you know, what if I want to play with different kind of materials and play that on the exterior or maybe even the glass and play that. It's a great tool to do that uh, within Showcase um, and very quick animation. Um, so previously we would have to do that and then open up Showcase and import you know, that specific file before that. This year, within on Revit, our, um, Autodesk Revit 2013, we've actually put in something called Sweet Workflow. Um, and you can actually automatically, by having this one click here, um, automatically bring the Revit model to 3ds Max and, or Showcase. And there are some, you see that, you know, within Showcase itself, there's all like you know, conceptual model, interactive walkthrough, realistic presentations. These are just kind of the pre preset um, information or predefined settings that's already been defined uh, for your model. So once it actually exports out, it will put it in a certain environment, put it in a more conceptual uh, look and feel for you already. So a lot of these great things that it really increases your productivity uh, where we previously just have to do a lot of clicking and importing, exporting that sort of stuff. So Angela, I have a question for you. Relative to that, like, you know, how much of the work that you've already done in Reddit? Let's say you've already started doing your visualization, you've assigned some materials, set up some cameras. How much of that comes across for you? Actually, everything comes across. So another, that's a great, great point, great point. You know, another great um, you know, thing about Autodesk is that, like, you know, within the last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue to improve on that, is that we are seeing this one graphic system where between AutoCAD, Inventor, uh, Showcase, um, 3S Max, Revit, and Florida, you know, we're using all one graphic system and one material, the single material library, so that if I'm importing from one to another, they all have the same material, so you don't have to, you know, there's no slight changes of, oh, maybe the material that I define in Revit is going to completely look different. We now have a consistent library on materials, so that's another benefit of, you know, going from one product to another within Autodesk itself. Fantastic. Okay. So how, how about within the product itself? Like, you know, what sort of uh, changes they actually heard? I heard some, some cool new viewing modes we can go ahead and take a look at. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other things that we have this year, which, you know, on visualization, um, it's been greatly improved. You know, previously, if you want to enhance, um, you know, maybe I want to put a nice guy in there, it's a little bit difficult previously because I would have to export this back to Photoshop. And once again, you know, you want to always, you know, one great thing about them is that you can always design up until the last minute. Um, you know, and I'm sure a lot of students do that as well. So, you know, for them to really... No, oh, that never happens. <laughs> Never. <laughs> you know, quickly play some really nice visualizations together and being able to present that I think is a really big benefit. So what we did is that um, we can now place a custom background image here. So I just have one um, placed in here already. It's just a sky image. I'm not going to click of OK. And you can see that I'm just in black and white lines, in hit and line mode. And the sky will automatically going to be loading in and placing in the background. So, and you're not only doing this in, that you can do this in perspective, but you can also do that in elevation, sections, isometric views, and so like that. Really quick rendering, you know, visualization stuff that takes really no time. That's, and That's actually kind of a really nice style unto itself. That's actually, uh, I, that's kind of nice looking at yeah, the black and white yeah. drawing with the sky in the background. Yeah, on. it's placing so, like shadows or something. You know, I, I think that alone you know, has been greatly enhanced in terms of revenue, which, you know, it's always been known as documentation.
Oh yeah, yep. Uh, it, it's a great improvement that I, you know, I absolutely love this. So okay, well, hopefully we'll see my, a lot more, you know, and just really, I know that it just helps out with a lot of students and so that to be able to do some really quick and you don't need to go and learn a lot of software just to present, you know, do some visualizations and so like that. Um, and also keeping everything inside of Reddit. So once again, you know, I could now, if I wanted to, I could start to change my design and be able to update it automatically without having to export this image out to Photoshop and do some more enhancements that I previously would have to do. Fantastic. So for the faculty members out there, just really think about all your students who said, oh, but I didn't have time to do the rendering and, you know, couldn't show you the, ah, oh, Josh, you're smiling. I can tell it doesn't happen to you. The ability to kind of really quickly do this, grab a screenshot and put it up on the board. Sounds like, uh, maybe it's encouraging the wrong paper students will keep designing the last minute. But, like, uh, there's no excuse for not actually coming out with something that looks pretty uh, reasonable and being able to share your design work. Right, yep. And then there's also a race case node, um, which is actually an interactive race case node that, once again, is actually kind of rendering the, um, the model and at the same time you can actually board it and have a more interactive kind of um, you know, presentation rate as well that I can you know, actually well, you know, or this into the model around, or I could also do it for interior. Um, another exciting thing that, you know, now that we always had rendering with data in the software itself, but another enhancement we've actually made is actually we integrated the rendering in the cloud within Autodesk Reddit 2013. Okay. So by clicking on here yeah. um, with a subscription, I just have to simply define, you know, there's two different choices. You can either simply choose the image or panorama view. Um, and, you know, it just sends your model, your Reddit model, your view up to the cloud and it's going to render it. And the best thing about it is that I can continue working, uh, you know, on my model. If I try to do a rendering inside of Revit, previously a lot of times it might, you know, a high quality might take, if you have a pretty powerful computer, it might take two to three hours or something minimum. Um, you know, now sending it to the cloud, I don't even have to worry about that two to three hours. I can just go back and start working. And, you know, a couple of really interesting things that I, as I mentioned, that, you know, we have this built image. Let me just go ahead and sign in. But it's just, it's just not in there. So does this mean, I always have this issue in my lab where you come on in, there's like a piece of paper over half the machine that say, do not touch rendering. Hi, uh, Josh, I can see it. Yeah, you see that? And like people are trying to get things done and deleting it running overnight and it never quite works out. So this means that the students can actually just send it out to the cloud and let it render and then like go home and we can keep on working on the machines and uh, get the results. All right, yep. And then, you know, and the nice thing about the cloud, I mean, I can download any of these images and then I can, you know, start sending it out. And as I mentioned that you can actually create panorama views um, of your rendering mm -hmm. through the cloud. So one thing I could do is now, it's, you know, I'm stationed at the location that I've defined. But now I can actually orbit around my model up and down 360 degrees. You know, what this actually really do to, to any of the students or anything is that it actually produces, you know, a more interactive way of presenting the drawing. And, you know, I can scan in the space and start looking all around and not just, you know, they would have to produce, you know, four different perspectives previously. And now this is a lot more interactive being able to do this interactive or panorama uh, rendering. And... Fantastic. I can see the students being a little worried, though. Right? Yeah. It used to be you could create that perfect screenshot that showed everything you wanted, but then, like, did exactly. everything else. Yeah, having the ability to kind of navigate around and really ask them to see what's behind you, uh, yeah. it's good for us. But it's yeah. Like, you mean they really have to think the design through? Yep, they, yeah, they do. So, you know, in a still image, I can definitely, you know, download the image. I can actually adjust some exposure, or I can just re-render if I didn't like um a new study, so if I didn't like how, you know, the quality of this, maybe I want a higher quality. I mean, a good thing about this is that, you know, if I wanted to, I could, you know, test out some of those renderings and materials and stuff inside of Revit, and then, you know, you can render it a little bit further even um, within the cloud in a higher quality. You know, just another thing I think, um, you know, to keep in mind is that, um, as you can see in the model, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, you know, there's some exterior windows and like that. But there's really no lighting picture. So if I was to render this inside of Revit without the lighting uh, for an interior, of course, it's going to be really, really dark. Um, but bringing it out to the cloud, cloud actually has some settings um, that actually allows you know, some exposure settings and that actually enables you to have this quality without having to think, oh, my God, i got to play 
there's facial light here, oh, this shot is too dark, I need to do this. You don't have to worry any, you know, about any of that. A lot of these have been predefined and, you know, comes out a pretty decent rendering, as you can see in my screen. Fantastic. So between, like, the, the more smart way of rendering, handling the rendering settings, and, like, the panorama, it sounds like the cloud's actually starting to offer some things that really you know, aren't available anywhere else. And that really, that may be one of the better ways, you know, to really get some of the intelligence as well as the power to set up those servers working. you got to do that for you. So, okay. All right. How do the students get this? Okay, if you set by a subscription, so what does that mean for, for me as a student? Um, you know, I think students, you can actually get uh, 25 cloud rendering units, um, you know, through, I believe they all, it's free, available, um, so that they can actually start to play around and access. And once again, um, you know, you have 25 free uh, units, so you might want to, you know, once again, if I mentioned that, you might want to do some test rendering, making sure all the materials are correct and so on. This is the draft maybe inside of Revit, and then, you know, once you're ready to say, all right, I'm done tweaking my materials, but I, I want a high-quality rendered image, go ahead and bring it to the cloud and, you know, have these nice-quality images. So what happens if students run out of units? Like, at, at the tail end, what happens then? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I should have a loaded or a loaded Because people ask me this all the time. You can't go ahead and just keep on doing things in Revit 3D aspects. Well, you always have this. So the cloud is kind of a great value-added service. But you know, honestly, you know, Angel can shake your head with all this too. Yeah, we're figuring out what it means in terms of the number of units and what students should be able to do and how they should be able to access more cloud units. So, you know, in the spirit of honesty, this really is you know, somewhat experimental. And we're trying it, really trying to see what the demand is going to be. And uh, we're trying, like, based on sort of how that works out and come up with the right model for making those units available to students. So, yeah, we're slowly all behind the scenes here. Like, you know, everything is completely decided. There's a lot of stuff we're just trying to learn based on the actual usage. And, uh, yeah, we're really quite interested in hearing your feedback about how this goes in your studios and really how this is going to work for you because we're trying to come up with a good model for this without being too much of a burden. Yeah, great technology, but like so many things in schools, how to go ahead and distribute it to people and make it available to everyone, that starts to give me a challenge because, you know, I'm not sure in my school, we don't have a full-time IT person standing on just waiting to go ahead and like us support all this stuff and I think a lot of programs are like that, you don't have that necessarily. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Ms. Angela, for sharing those things with us. Awesome. Please stick around online because I'm certain we'll get some questions about some of that fantastic stuff just a little bit later. Okay, Mr. Josh, why don't you go ahead and bring up your screen as we go ahead and introduce you. <laughs> Josh is an assistant professor at Auburn University and he's the co-director of the Integrated Design and Construction Program, really leading up the design track there. And some of the things your folks are working on there just are fantastic, but I'm so keen to have you share these things. <laughs> Talk about just how the whole integrated design and construction program works and who your students are and just sort of give us a feel for what's going on so people can be inspired to think about how this can fly in their own schools. Sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sure. All right. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little background on the program and talk a little about uh, what we're doing. Uh, if, uh, again, obviously, if you have any questions along the way, um, just stop me and we can go from there. Um, so we are the Master of Integrated Design and Construction Program at Auburn. We have a one-year post-professional master's degree. Uh, sort of informally, my, uh, my, my motto for the program is that we're trying to teach students to build better buildings better. So in, 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 in kind of catchy statement is an idea about a product, which is a better buildings, a better built environment, and an idea about project, uh, process which is uh, putting those better buildings in a better way. Um, and, and we really kind of start from this framework, which we saw, it's a, it's a bit of a reaction to industry. You know, we, we saw a, a number of things happening in industry um, that, that we're in a, in a way sort of reacting to. And, and those three things are sort of organizational shift uh, in, in the way that project teams and projects are managed, uh, the, the continuing impact of information technologies, uh, in the form of things like BIM, uh, obviously the cloud, uh, remote collaboration, distributing those kinds of things, um, and, and really the mainstreaming as a goal, as the product, the, the mainstreaming of the of the green or the sustainability movement, uh, which really demands uh, a more high-performing, more quality uh, product, and 
the influence on process there has to do with more performance-based or evidence-based design. Um, and so if you kind of look at those things in a way, this uh, area, I'm going to kind of switch between a couple of things here, so, so, so bear with me. Um, okay, yeah, process products. Um, so, you know, this, this is really about uh, people. So I'm having a hard time in this shit that's done that. This. Okay. Here we go. So up here we have the, the people. Over here we have the tools. Down here we have the goal for the product. And that's really the, the kind of framework that, that we set up in the program. Um, and the way we do that is we have an integrated program. Half of our students come in with architecture degrees and half of them come in with construction management degrees. And so we have the design track and the construction track. And that is Integrated design construction in a nutshell. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I like working with mixed groups. You know, if you find that the designers and the contractors, you know, is, is a really effective collaboration from the pulling them together, how does that work? Is it an effective collaboration? Yeah, and I was wondering, you know, you know, they kind of come in from different sides. Like, you know, how do we get them together and kind of like uh, pull them to the center? Yeah, well, I mean, it's really a project based curriculum. And, in a lot of ways, we're, we're working against um, a long tradition of uh, adversarial relationships that, that, that gets kind of reinforced in a lot of undergraduate education. And so, in a way, we have to, to uh, unravel that and, and kind of go back and, and learn how to work together again. And, and that's happening in industry right now as well. Um, fortunately for us, uh, our students are here because they want to learn that. And, and the market is incentivizing that type of behavior as we shift towards more integrated models. Okay, so really just, you know, being very project focused and responding to really what the, the industry is demanding now really requires that we're working together in more of a, what is it, ITD or just a more integrated way where designers need to understand about tons of construction and vice versa. Exactly. And that's a great example. ITD is a great example. Uh, new lean type processes is a great example. But this idea that it really is it's project centric. It's about the project, not about the individual success of uh, any any team member. Um, and so we take that as, as our setup. That's that's where we start, um, and we use the tools, uh, the best tools available to us to sort of enable that process. Um, and and um, you know we've been doing this for about three years, and and, and so far uh, the results are are, are pretty compelling. Fantastic. So do you have any examples of either you know projects people have been working on or yeah, the, the, like, you know, the, the types of companies that are, like, you know, sort of drawing your students now. Yeah, tell us about the successes. It sounds like a fantastic program. Yeah, we have a couple things, and I'll just put through a couple things and show you some examples. Um, and, and you'll see immediately also, you know, since we're talking about the, the Revit product, you'll see the, the impact um, that Revit 2015 will potentially have on, on the work we do based on the work we've done for the last couple of years. And so we do typically two types of projects. Uh, we do some uh, research projects, which are um, either university research or industry partner research, where we actually are uh, working with uh, companies in the industry on, on, on some problems for them. And we, we let the students pursue those that research in the classroom. Uh, and we also do sort of outreach type uh, design and pre-construction projects where we're out uh, working for real clients uh, in the built environment and providing uh, services, designing construction services. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead here. So just going back a couple of years, um, you know, here's a, a project, a couple of versions of a project that we did for the city of Chattanooga uh, on, on a library there. Um, and here's the, you know, this idea of the integrated modeling thing. It, because we really sort of demand that our students work in the, essentially within Revit, within those three kind of realms, uh, within architecture, within structure, and within MEP, um, we have, we've always historically had a lot of linked, linked models and a lot of files out there floating around. Um, and so here you can see an example of a, of a library, and this is a rendering out of Revit, so, um, and this is actually just a view of the, the mechanical model for that, for that project. Uh, you know, here's one that was actually uh, one that we uh, won a competition for, for a, a footbridge, a pedestrian bridge for Volkswagen. 
Uh, and similarly here up in the uh, left-hand corner, you see the, the rendering. Uh, up in the right-hand corner, you see the structural model. Uh, and what's sort of interesting about this uh, lower right-hand image is that the, 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 uh, the, sort of the facade panels on the, on the bridge stand there were imported out of Inventor. So we're really working, you know, we push as many tools as possible um, within our program. I think it's equally important that students just become, you know, uh, develop a facility with working with multiple programs as much as they develop a facility in one. And so the idea that, you know, we can now start to put all these pieces together um, is, is really great, it's really compelling. Uh, and I'll just kind of jump through a couple more. Um, this is uh, one of those research projects, and it, it might not seem, it, it, images might seem a little difficult to read offhand, but, you know, this was a partnership with Turner Construction um, looking at a hospital that they were building and starting to break down the building uh, into modularized components and starting to um, investigate the best ways to prefab and modularize the building to improve efficiency, uh, use lean processes, just-in-time delivery, uh, whole planning, the, the whole kind of gamut in that, in that regard. Um, and it was, you know, it was pretty interesting for the students to get involved with something like that. And we had a great relationship with, with Turner as well. Um, this slide is an example of um, some, some, some uh, university research that we're doing into uh, radiant wall panels for residential construction. And again, these, these things tie together, um, you know, a lot of this is just very sort of engineering-oriented analysis that looks at, um, uh, setting up a, a physical prototype to do some real physical testing on. Um, but we're all also really interested in the sort of digital digital side of the analysis and the simulation and how we can start to uh, leverage the tools available to us to inform both whole building energy models uh, as well as uh, fabrication models as well as smaller scale kind of thermal analysis and that type of thing. And then, um, just, just sort of like give people a sense of that project. And that's uh, the Habitat for Humanity project that we were looking at in, in January when I was in on campus? Uh, yeah, this is actually uh, a project that uh, one of our other faculty members, Ryan Salvis, uh, who teaches in the program, uh, is heading up. And they're looking, they're trying to uh, understand what the implications on Habitat for Humanity houses uh, might be if they start to, if they come up with a model for uh, easily constructible and deployable radiant systems. Uh, a lot of the energy use in those types of buildings is, uh, uh, is related to systems, and so it's just looking at it as an alternative to get away just from the, the window unit air conditioner or even central air conditioning uh, and heating as a, as a way of uh, conditioning those buildings. And so they're really back to the first principles here, building radiant panels from scratch, uh, setting up a sort of uh, hot box or cold box uh, testing environment, and they're using a, a kinesiology lab with a thermal thermal lab uh, in order to do that. And so that, that's a little bit of this work. And we'll be actually taking some of this stuff out and uh, similarly um, building up these wall panels in uh, Inventor uh, and hopefully doing some uh, visual simulation as well to, to see how that stacks up against the physical simulation. Fantastic. And what I really like to draw out for some of the faculty that are listening is that yeah, this, this went from like ID, ideating and just really being a very brainstormy, you know, you know, actual physical models that we're testing in the lab with simulation modeling along the way. It's all been in three months. It's pretty, it's pretty fantastic what you've accomplished that amount of time. Wow, I'm really impressed by how far this has come. Yeah, our students are uh, we push them, we push them pretty hard. And, and um, you know, that, that goes back to some of the stuff Angela was saying about the, the you know, being able to, to quickly to get output, to get documentation and different types of output from the tools in, in an expedient manner is something that we really, really uh, push because we don't always have time for our students to be doing uh, really elaborate sort of presentations and really elaborate renderings and those kinds of things. They just need to move, move fast. Okay. So, so to wrap it, just so that we can leave some time for the Q&A at the end here, like, you know, what is the outcome of this in terms of your, you know, you're, you're creating these fantastic students who are versed in all these different aspects. You know, what's the outcome? What actually happens for them at the end of all this process? How, how are they in terms of their employability? You know, what's going on on that side? Um, they're, they're actually doing great, um, and it's, it's getting better. I, 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 I guess I could sort of say that the economy seems to be 
improving, at least in, in some of the things, uh, indicators that we're seeing. But even when the economy was bad, our students were um, almost 100% employed within you know several months of, of graduation. Um, and a lot of them, uh, the, the technology aspect of this program is providing a skill set that they're, they're, they're getting our students hired. Um, a whole, you know, there's four of them out of our first class that all work for Turner Construction and are uh, doing in BIM leadership uh, positions there. And interestingly, of that four, two of them came from construction management and two of them came from design. They both are fantastic. And then what I feel like is that you're not only sort of learning the tools, yeah, and I really just pull it back to, they're really learning a process and just really the whole way the industry is changing so radically. You know, BIM is sort of at the center of this, but really there's something much bigger going on than just learning tools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the sort of thing about learning to collaborate is actually a pretty big deal. I mean, everybody talks about collaboration and, and, sort of, and throws the term around a lot, but it's really a learned behavior. It takes, uh, it, it takes some experience and some understanding of uh, some strategies and techniques. Um, and it takes a little time to, to learn how to collaborate across those disciplines, especially when, in many, many cases, um, uh, our disciplines have been trained not to cooperate in that way. And so, you know, that, that coupled with the technical skill set, um, in addition to this, you know, the, the, the knowledge base that they have when they arrive at the program, um, I, I feel like they, they, they leave here in a, in a pretty strong position uh, relative to the industry. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Hang on for just a second. Let, you know, we're going to try and get to Q&A and let people sort of like uh, query a little bit more about how this is going. If you can throw the screen back to me, I just want to like point people towards just a couple of resources I want to make sure they know about so they can like think about how to get going with it. So on your side, go back to the Adobe Connect thing and say stop sharing. I'll share mine again ever so briefly and we'll try and get to this little bit of information pretty quickly. So I think that what I want to do, and of course I'm always choosing the wrong one, to point people to a couple key things I want you to know about to so make sure that like you go to and like take advantage of. One is for anyone who's watching, you know, we want you to become a member of the audit education community and help students at audit.com, but we want faculty participating too. And when people go to the student community or go to the education community, there's a couple of good things they need to know about. One is there's just all sorts of free software available for them, and this is available for students as well as faculty to download. And it's really just the whole suite of Autodesk products, all the AutoCAD, all the Revit, the Maya, the Navisworks. Something that's been very popular lately is T-Spline, the plug-in for working with Rhino and being able to pull the nerves out a little bit better. Another one that's kind of a really exciting one right now is simulation, multi-physics. Oh, I'm trying to find I guess, yeah, that's the one that's up there now. For really some advanced simulation capabilities. But these things are available. You can download them freely, put them on your machine. There's a three-year license. And the idea is just to get these hands into the people or these cool people's hands so they can really start exploiting them and doing fantastic things for them. Another kind of really cool thing we want to let you know about is the whole education community. So they are sort of proud of. I worked on this with a bunch of my students at Stanford University. What we did was based on some classes that we had to go out going there. We put together a whole curriculum full of all sorts of lessons to help people get going with the BIM tools. Now, a little intimidating, we lost what you're doing, Joshua, but oh my God, where do we get started with this? It seems like there's so much you need to start with. And this is really just a very popular series of things starting with the basics of building modeling, and then if you're more focused lessons on, for example, green building design, or very relevant to today's topic, there's a whole unit on multidisciplinary coordination. Like you model structural elements, electric systems, plumbing, mechanical, and all those different features. So later on down, we have more about IPD and how we can use the construction modeling side of it, or even how to model based estimating or using BIM for fabrication. A lot of good lessons out there. And the basic picture of these, just so people know where these are, is that if you go into the lesson, there's a small introductory material along with some you know, key terms and learning objectives, but there's a whole series of different exercises out there. And within those exercises, there's always a video, something that's usually three or four minutes that you can show in class and just have students look at on their own, as well as 
a data set you can download, both the Imperial and the metric versions, depending upon what you need. So students can actually play along with what they're seeing in the videos and really explore and make it their own. As well as a little exercise, something you can assign to students and they can work on, most of them being targeted for something you can probably complete in about 30 minutes to an hour, something like that to really exercise what you saw in the video and then move on to the next step. So this curriculum is a fantastic resource, freely available to anyone with data sets, tutorial videos, just a great resource for people to take advantage of. So, you know, please do in terms of taking advantage of that. There's also, if for folks who are specifically interested in sustainability, a whole companion workshop, the sustainability workshop, which contains, again, some tools and software, but also a lot of videos that sort of explain sustainability principles, you know, in terms of net zero energy buildings, life cycle assessment of uh, the materials, just a broad range of stuff out there. So there's some fantastic resources available out there. And we just want to let people know they're available so that you know, you're not alone in it. We're really here to help you succeed and incorporate this in your classroom. So uh, just take advantage of that and know they're there. Okay. So I'll just kind of finish with all that. The, oh, the URL is you know, so you kind of have a quickie on that. Students.audit.com is the one to get the free software and it will uh, get to the uh, educational community. This is an important URL for people. If you want to get started with Revit today, you can go with the 2013 version. You can download the trial version here. Project Masari is another great tool for people interested in sustainability analysis and eco design. And there's the sustainability workshops URL as well as finally the big curriculum. So there's lots of stuff available for you. And again, the big key to this is we want you to be able to get started with the stuff today and start using it in your own classrooms. Register with the community, download the software, and then really use these workshops to help yourself learn about the tools, but also to give your students something to work with so they can start learning about the tools too. Okay, that's pretty much it in terms of what we want to present to get you going with these things. What I'd really love to do now is just kind of turn it over to you guys and let's start seeing. Oh, so how do, so what do I have to do? Operator, can you open up the line for a Q&A? Certainly. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 to withdraw your question. Please press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Okay, we're just waiting for anything, anything people want to know, either about the specifics of the software or some of the rendering capabilities we saw here. You know, about what's going on in Josh's program, the whole IDC program. The first question is from, I have Habib, if your line is open. Yes, uh, do you, uh, with the Rivet 13, are we able to save the files at STL where we can uh, print them in 3D? Okay, let me see if I can go ahead and take that one. Um, there is a special STL exporter that's available. It's actually uh, open source, and it's been released to that in the community. Actually, if you, if you send us, uh, oh, I should find it for you, but if you send us uh, an email message, like, uh, oh, I want to show you where my email address is, at blankcast.autodesk.com, I can point you towards that. But, yes, there is an STL exporter. In fact, if you just even, like, search for it by Google, there is one that will let you export an STL file for 3D printing. And Angela, did that ever get built into the product, or I think it's just been released as part of the open source community? What do you think about that? That's correct. Okay, so there is one, and it actually works very well. Um, you can just take this 3D model and kind of pop it out to that. In fact, let me go back over to the slides for just a second. Actually, back up on the slides. Hang on. Oh, actually, no. I'll do this. Go back over to the web. If I can. Oh, I'm so bad about navigating around in this thing. Okay, there we go. I'll try. What I was going to show you is actually, there's a piece of the, uh, there it is, uh, in the BIM curriculum. If you go to, back in the BIM curriculum, if you want to sort of see an example of how to use the STL Explorer, go on down to that uh, under Unit 7, Lesson 4, using BIM for fabrication. We actually point you to that STL Explorer and show you how you would export a Revit model and then, yeah, take it in for actually doing some 3D printing. So that's a good place to get started. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Herbie. All right. Okay. The next question is from Nerala Blizzard. Your line is open. Hello, Hi. Hi. Hello. Yes. Uh, my question is about Revit API. Uh, you know, 
developing new tools. Is there any new development about 2013? Well, actually, yeah. Okay, let's talk about that. And Angela, you may know more about this. I've actually been playing around with the Revit API for a class we're working on for USC right now. Um, yes, the, the API keeps on getting enhancements every year. Um, there's a Revit API SDK, and actually you can install it. I think it actually just comes as part of the, the main installer now. It's, just, uh, it's under deployments and tools. It's kind of hitting a funny place in the installer. But you can install the SDK. Um, it kind of has a lot of API examples. And what last year, a lot of the API enhancements were all about kind of constructability features. I'm trying to think, yeah, uh, Angela, is there any sort of like, are there any highlights about what's changed in the API this year? Or is it more accessing like a component of stairs? Or, you know, what, what, what's sort of different in the API this year that you know of right off hand? I mean, there are some additional, you know, like features of the API that we actually start to implement is that, um, you know, you can, with every new feature, almost every new feature that we have, there is a capability of actually um, possibly having an API with it so that if you, you know, if you feel that it's not appropriate for your classroom or you want to customize, for example, we've heard a lot of customers say, you know, and I actually also implement this myself, um, you know, I never wanted to explode, um, import CAD or explode my CAD files. Um, so that, that might be something you don't want your math users, you know, the rest of your users to actually go ahead and do, then there is a capability for you to actually go turn on and off those features as well. So we're enhancing, you know, the features and, you know, me working at a you know, professional firm, just like that, uh, where I actually was uh, implementing you know, and training over 600 staff, you know, there, even though I have a curriculum, there's always certain things that, you know, based on the project, you know, then I don't train every single site. So if there's nothing, if it's just an interior project, I don't ever train on the site. So this you know, probably gives people capability of, you know, such a complex tool, you know, software that you can start to say, I'm going to just teach these things to these people and, you know, really start to be able to customize all those things. So, but those are those, some of those enhancements that we are definitely working on on the API side and people can, you know, go ahead and turn things on and off as well. Yeah, and just to give some people context who aren't just familiar with it, the API really is a, is a programming interface that really, there's two classic things you do with it. One is either change the functionality of the fault product by either turning on or turning off different features or changing the way they function. And if you can do some programming in C-sharp, you can actually kind of really customize the little thing you want to have happen in it. The other class of things people tend to do with it is they build add-ins and extensions, things that might actually have a special application. So, for example, I thought a fantastic example of student worked on where Oh, they came up with an idea that would for their design based upon different seats and locations in the theater. It would actually help them keep the sight lined and where block seats were. Something that's really a custom application. They didn't build into the default product, but we're starting to see an awful lot of people extending the product, using it as a platform and building custom tools to really support their specific kinds of design through the API. So, yeah, not for everyone just getting started, but if they're really pushing up against the limits and wanting to do something really cool, the API is really, it, it almost makes it about what you can do because the whole problem, well, just about all the product is really driven through an API series of commands right now and those are accessible to you. Yeah, so that's just another thing that um, actually came on at RDF, um, you know, kind of on Reddit or RDF itself this year is actually something we have an exchange store. Um, so it's, uh, the URL is actually app.exchange.rdf.com and what that is is actually brings you, you know, all those added content that we have and so that um, we are you know, that now there's a central location where you can download these, and we are really looking for a lot of developers to create these kind of add, um, you know, kind of add-ins and content and like that. So if you click the store, there's actually 14 different software available right now. So Glenn is clicking to RDF Revit, and you can see that there is a list of, um, you know, software add-ins and like that. For example, like the re uh, room renumbering, um, some trilogies for, um, programming stuff and so like that, that you can actually start to download. Um, you know, some of them are free, and some of them, I, I think, they are charted. But, um, you know, this is another place where we are actually encouraging and we are constantly looking for developers to actually help us and creating some of these, um, you know, add-in content that you can download to the Revit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, please. At this time, there are no more questions. Fantastic. Okay. Well, there are no more questions at this time. How about any sort of parting advice? Mr. Josh, let's turn it over to you. So, if we were thinking about, oh, yeah, sorry to put you on the spot, right? <laughs> like, yeah. any, any parting words, yeah, to inspire other faculty who might be thinking about integrated modeling and just wondering about getting started in the value 
of doing this. Now, what would you tell everyone you have to share your best words of wisdom? Uh, you know, in a lot of cases, I just think that um, it, it comes, in you know, a lot of ways it does come down to faculty. You have to sort of be willing to reach out to other disciplines and other departments. And I know that we're kind of lucky here at Auburn that we have a good relationship between architecture and building science. Um, you know, here is the institutions that if you don't have those relationships, um, I think that those are the, that's the first step. And then, you know, once you get that in place, I think that the, the, the rest of it kind of falls into place and you find ways of, of doing things. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's actually very good advice. Yeah, it really does kind of go building the relationships and like, uh, and trying to foster that. And I think that really, uh, for me, as I think about you know, the teaching I do and stuff like that, the big thing that I really try to drive home more than anything is this notion of really the tools, the role of the tools, and how to keep them in place. Yeah, you know, because the tools are a piece of what's going on here, but there's an overall like process and some principles that guide the way we use the tools. And the key is, you know, for not to let people get so lost in the tools that they're losing control of the product and you know, the process. You really have to like that. Uh, yeah, the tools are fantastic. They'll really go very, very far for you. But our role as faculty members is really much more in providing the mentorship and the overall guidance about how to apply them in a meaningful way as opposed to just like uh, you know, exercising tools for tools' sake. So uh, there's still, even though you know, like the number of tools keeps on you know, talking on, if there's so many, you can't keep up on them all. But I sort of learned to embrace them and say that, hey, independent of what's going on with all the tools, I still have some value based on the years of experience of helping you know, mentor and guide them towards appropriate uses because you know, those principles don't change or the tools do every other year.